Hey guys, what's up? It's Jen, welcome back. This is a good one. Now, unfortunately, I'm not really feeling tip-top shape. We had the snow come in today, and you know how the changes in weather can be a little bit tricky on the brain. I did not wear my WeatherX earplugs. Check out this video if you've never heard of WeatherX earplugs. That can lessen the effects of the barometric pressure shifts, but I didn't do it today, and I am feeling the pressure in my head. As always, I'll probably be a little bit loopy and forget some things. If you're new here, that is totally normal because I have high cranial pressure. It's known as IIH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, or PTC, pseudotumor cerebri. It all means the same thing. Too much fluid makes pressure on my brain, and that causes all sorts of problems. But before I was diagnosed with my pseudotumor, I was misdiagnosed with chronic migraine and treated for chronic migraine for five years. Finally, just a few months ago, I connected to a new doctor who diagnosed me almost right away with my pseudotumor. Whoop, service dog Buddy came in. Come on over, Buddy. Buddy, pa. Good boy, meerkat. Come on, meerkat. Good boy, there's Buddy. Good boy, okay. He's all wet from the snow. Uh, where was I? My symptom onset was mid-2016. I got really bad with the pseudotumor symptoms in the beginning of 2017. And then in August of 2021, just a few months ago, I got connected with a new doctor who diagnosed me almost immediately with my pseudotumor. And I will tell you more about her in just a minute. Yes, I will name drop and tell you what her clinic is and let you know how you can get connected to her as well. The main point of this video though is to tell you guys about what my early onset symptoms were. I actually went back into my notes that I was sending my doctors and I took excerpts, actual words that I was using to describe my symptoms. I was expecting this to be something that was helpful for you guys to maybe help differentiate between IIH and migraine if you happen to be going through some of the same symptoms as me. What I wasn't expecting was to be absolutely infuriated that this wasn't caught sooner. I mean, there were some big red flags and someone should have connected all of these dots. And I don't want this happening to anybody else. I want to let you guys know all of these things and give you my resource in one big lump. Here you go. I'm going to fast forward to the good part of the story, my diagnosis. Once I was connected to a doctor who was familiar with not only pseudotumor, but POTS and hypermobility and friends, I'll just call it, and friends. At my very first appointment, she boldly told me, yeah, I think you totally fit pseudotumor cerebri. I feel very confident in that. Who was this doctor? It was Dr. Diana Driscoll at the POTS Care Clinic in Texas. I saw her virtually from the comfort of my own home, and I also got to see other doctors like a hypermobility doctor, Finally, she ordered eye testing for me that I could get done here in my area. I also got some custom blood work done after she actually looked through my records and found things in tests that were done before that those doctors who had ordered the tests didn't even look into the tests and find and tell me about. Was that a good sentence? Did that make any sense? At POTS care, POTS is recognized as a symptom, not as a diagnosis. So rather than saying, hey, salt and socks, they say, no, let's see what's actually causing your POTS and try to get this at the source. It's the only clinic that's dedicated to treating the underlying causes of POTS, but what makes the place actually unique is Dr. Diana Driscoll herself. She had POTS, she had high cranial pressure, she suffered twice as long as I did, 10 years she was dealing with these conditions. She was doing the doctor hopping. She was being ignored. She was being brushed off as anxiety. Her kids went through it. Her kids had POTS. She had to watch her children suffer. She understands the frustration of doctors not connecting dots and not being versed in how the same thing can affect many different systems. You know, my cardiologist would note my heart stuff, but he wouldn't connect it to my brain stuff. Dr. Driscoll suffered through all of it and then did a bunch of research and opened up this clinic and connected with other doctors so that other people don't need to suffer the way that she did, the way that I was before I found her. Oh, I need to do just a whole video about how much I love POTS care. Everything I needed in a doctor, Dr. Driscoll just did as a policy. All the record digging, 
I wasn't just another number there, you know, and they did not know that I was a YouTuber until I slipped it in on the very last day. To Dr. Driscoll, I could tell that I truly was a patient. I was a friend. I was someone that she cared about treating. And if you would like to go see Dr. Driscoll, let her know that I sent you, that I referred you, and you will get a $200 discount on your POTS care program. The discount is for their main program, but they also have a separate track that's just pseudotumor. That's not the deep dive, the EDS, all of that stuff. That's just looking at pseudotumor. That's one option. I forget my sentence. There's another option called the POTS care package. That's an app that you get on your phone where you can listen to audios about inflammatory POTS. And they also send you a package in the mail. And I'm going to do an unboxing of that package so you can learn exactly what's in the POTS care package that comes with the app. Again, make sure you let them know that I sent you. And I have already filmed a collaboration video with Dr. Driscoll herself. I asked you guys what questions you had for my doctor and I hopped on a Zoom call with Dr. Driscoll and we recorded the whole thing so that you guys can hear the answers to hear her answers to your questions straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Dr. Driscoll, I don't actually think that you're a horse. The baby is kicking a lot and it is distracting. I cannot over exaggerate the importance of getting a proper diagnosis. I was being treated for things that I didn't even have and that was causing more problems in me. It was inconsistent. It was frustrating. I was blaming myself. I thought that I was crazy a lot because things just weren't matching up. So getting a proper diagnosis is so important. If you run out of coolant, you can't change the oil and then expect it to just work. I needed like a full break job, guys, and I couldn't have known that without the POTS care clinic. And now that I have a doctor on my side who's like truly there rooting for me, I can't overstate the importance of that either. These crazy episodes that I have, I feel like they used to just get laughed off. And with Dr. Driscoll, like she's actually had them. She's actually felt the panic of those crazy episodes. Like I'm completely speechless about how big of a difference it was. I'm like, doctor, please, please understand me. Please listen, please, I know I'm not crazy every single time I went to a doctor's appointment and then I go to an appointment with Dr. Driscoll and she's like, oh my gosh, those episodes, they can be so terrifying, but we can really mitigate how much you're having those. And honestly, I'm not even having those crazy episodes anymore. It's only been three months and I'm barely on any treatment because I'm pregnant. I'm so freaking grateful. Certainly enough for this video for now. Let's move on to symptoms. What were my early onset symptoms? Got my notes. Okay, to be clear, I do get migraines. Migraine does run in my family. So it wasn't like totally wrong for my neurologist to say migraine. But when my migraines became chronic, I was expressing to my neurologist, and I even said it on YouTube, I believe, when I talked about my diagnosis story a year ago, which is way before I had any idea that I had pseudotumor. Like that was when I was convinced I only had migraine. Even then, I was joking that my chronic migraine was absolutely in no way similar to the episodic migraines that I had suffered in the past. Zero. I said it should have a different name because it feels totally different. I sure hope I got that on film. And in my case, I was absolutely right. What do you know? You know your body. Trust your body. Listen to your body. And a lot of the symptoms of pseudotumor do match the symptoms of migraine, but I want you to notice the subtleties and the ways that I'm describing my symptoms to see if you can pick up on the red flags that I certainly feel like my neurologist should have picked up on. Mostly that my symptoms have really always been too positional to just be chronic migraine and they were also very activity related, like much more activity related than chronic migraine should be. I often said things like when I cough or when I exert, when I blink, when I bend over, when I go to bed, which is when I lay down. All of these should have been red flags. So see if you can pick those out when I'm reading you these symptoms. First things first, this is actually from an email that I sent to my doctor and wait till you hear her response to it. This is to my primary care, not my neurologist. But my ear canals were one of the first things to give me a lot of problems. So one of the first things they did was attack it with steroids and also do scans of the ear canals. Steroids failed. The ear canal stuff all looked normal. So I told my doctor that the word finding, getting dizzy, inability to focus is interfering with work. I said I've been vomiting, 
from feeling nauseous and seasick? Is there anything that can be done? And she said, try to limit caffeine and acidic foods. Zantac twice a day will help with the acid pains. Acidic foods. What? I started my email with, I'm getting increasingly concerned because things feel like they're progressing past just my ears. It felt so urgent to me that I was worried about waiting for another month before another scan. And she thinks I'm talking about acid reflux when I'm talking about ears and brain fog and dizziness and my inability to focus being so bad that it's interfering with my job. Limit caffeine. Limit acidic foods. Zantac. Okay. From the Nationwide Children's IIH Clinic, symptoms of IH or intracranial hypertension may include ringing sound in the ears, headaches, and vision problems. Vision problems including blurred vision, double vision, loss of vision, especially in the peripherals. So let's talk about each of those one by one in my case. As I said, I presented with ear stuff first. I said I had near constant ringing in my ears as well as ear bombs where there's a sudden burst, usually followed by a high-pitched noise, and I mean the high-pitched noise never really goes away. I used words like whooshing, muffled, I said when I'm horizontal, horrible bursts, and pulsatile bursts, meaning it's going along with my heartbeat. I said sometimes it's loud and persistent, or it's sudden and shocking, that my inner ears are constantly burning and there's a sensation of pressure inside them. And that sometimes when one of my ears rings, it like knocks me dizzy for a few minutes and I can't move or focus for a few minutes because of whatever it was that like exploded in my ear. These are quotes. Second thing on that list was headaches, head pain. And I did have high head pain even outside of the migraine attacks. Whenever my doctor asked me how many migraine days I had, I always told her, well, I have this headache like all the time and then I also have these episodes that are like seizures but they're sort of like panicky seizures and a lot of vertigo and then I also have these things that I'm coining migraines but they're not that painful. They're actually just really confusing and I'll look like I have a stroke. So I didn't even know what to call migraine and what to call a headache and what to call tension but I had head pain even between my migraines and what I have learned now is that that head pain was my increased pressure and then the migraines are when it bursts out of my nose, out of my ear, z ears, I have both ears, and my pressure drops low and migraine gen seems to be low pressure and that can happen with pseudotumor patients. Um, I called the head pain throbbing, high pressure, and I also mentioned that I had skull base and neck pain. Another thing that's very common with pseudotumor, your neck gets very stiff from the pressure buildup, the fluid buildup, and brain ache. I said I didn't recall the last day I didn't have a headache that was like this. It's been at least 10 years. I said that my headache happened more with movement, that it could be distinct and branching, mostly right-sided, eyeballs and when I cough. Pain behind the eye, common in pseudotumor because you get a lot of pressure. There's not a lot of places in your head that are soft enough for the pressure to go. So ears are soft, eyes are soft. So you'll have patients showing papilledema behind their eyes where the optic nerve gets pressed. You'll also hear complaints of ear stuff, nose sinus stuff, and leaking down the back of the throat. Your skull is hard, it just hurts and feels like it's gonna explode. I also told my doctor that I had to get sleepy sitting up. I would literally sit up or I would lay down on my husband. I'd put a pillow on my husband and then me so I could be vertical while I got tired enough to fall asleep. And then at the very last second, I would lay down flat to go to bed. Every single morning, I would wake up super stuffy, again, from that pressure. The reason that I couldn't lay down flat for long enough to get tired was because of the pressure buildup in my head. All of these should have been red flags to my neurologists. Plural. I saw many neurologists. Third on that list was vision problems. I did frequently have blurry and double vision. Some of the auras that I had, I described them as flashing or stars. Some I called heat spots. Now that I've been properly diagnosed, I know that these heat spots 
are my high pressure spots. The flashing lights that are in the middle, those are your typical migraine auras. This is so complicated. <laughs> I said that I saw stars in my peripherals, especially when I cough or if I ever went upside down. I said that I would have stars to the left. All this peripheral stuff is classic for IIH or pseudotumor. Vision loss is usually in the peripherals first, so I have red. I said in the lower right, I have these camo looking heat spots. And sometimes I got heat spots when I moved my head Migraine auras, I don't believe they change with head movement. I said I have giant green circles, giant blue circles, colorful spots up above, and I said that when I laid down to go to bed, sometimes it was like a rave, a rave of just flashing colors. Literally, I used the word rave, but only when I was laying down. Again, not typical of migraine to only have your aura when you're laying down. Don't quote me on it, but I'm pretty freaking sure. Scroll, 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 scroll. Some other symptoms of pseudotumor cerebri, other symptoms of IIH or idiopathic intracranial hypertension that I found online. I'm gonna mention those, mention the comments that I made about them to my doctors way back when. And these also were brushed off as either migraine or conversion disorder. You just have anxiety, it's in your head, blah, blah, blah. You know the story, you know the sob story. Two huge red flags, one, papilledema was noted in my eye exam from February of 2017. That was why my neurologist ordered the urgent MRI. Papilledema is swelling of the optic nerve or optic nerve getting compressed against the back of the eyeball. Huge red flag, huge indicator of tumor or pseudotumor. And I don't know about with regular brain tumors, but with pseudotumor, that papilledema can come and go and mine certainly did. Mine was also minor, but it was there. Second thing is I had a metallic taste, a metallic taste in my mouth, which I now know is kind of indicative of a CSF problem. I was complaining about burning in the back of my throat, the sensation of fluid in my sinuses, and I was saying that it tasted metallic and it was salty. And the combination of those two things should have instantly made them be like, oh gosh, this is not just migraine. And it did, but then I got the MRI and the MRI was normal, so then they just dropped the whole case for IIH and they were like, yep, you're just, you're migraine. And that was the start of the slow decline of my health over the next five years to the point that I became almost totally disabled, trained up a service dog, lost my job, had to move. Everything that happened from all of this could have been avoided if only they didn't take the normal MRI and say, okay, you're not worth looking into anymore. Not for lack of trying. I was going to specialists all over the place. Neck stiffness. I had it so much that they actually did a full workup on my neck to see if this was neck caused tension headaches that I was feeling. I was diagnosed with torticolli in my neck when I was like 14 or 15. I have military neck, meaning there's no curve in it. It's straight and leans forward. And it's also slipping at the base, but the slipping is stable for now. So they were like, well, you have a bunch of neck problems. Your neck tension is probably neck tension. And they gave me a prescription for baclofen. Here's a pill, a band-aid. Turns out if you lower the cranial pressure, the neck tension goes away. Hmm. Okay, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. Again, they can happen with migraines, common migraine symptom. However, they were happening to me outside of migraines. And I was describing my nausea as with very slight head movement. It seemed like the house was tipping, that I felt seasick. Sometimes I would say, I had no nausea today until my ears started stabbing, and then suddenly I had nausea. And for months, I was throwing up every single day, multiple times a day, because of this seasickness. And that was when I was working in a lab, so I was undressing all the PPE, run to the restroom, try to be as quiet as I can, because it's super embarrassing. But yeah, I held a full-time job, and I was puking two, three times a day at work, because sometimes... I just, I felt so seasick. And I also want to mention forgetfulness, or what we fondly call brain fog. I noted a lot of trouble thinking, that I was spacey, that I couldn't remember anything from one day to the next. I was also describing that I was having episodes, the episodes that I was mentioning earlier. 
I would say frequent episodes of being spacey. This is the partial seizure episodes that I have shared videos of for you guys before. Sometimes I would say I had many big episodes or I would have many episodes every hour. Again, this is not typical for migraine. Migrainers don't go into these lapses of consciousness many times an hour. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't fit the diagnosis that I had. And I didn't understand these episodes until the POTS care clinic. I don't want to make this video too long by talking a bunch about the POTS care clinic and like the way it works, but basically there's way too much to teach you about your conditions when you go in for your appointments. So what Dr. Driscoll does is she gives you audios to listen to. It's like two per week. They're usually only like 10 or 15 minutes long and you learn so much about your conditions. You can listen to them at your own pace. You can pause, rewind. You don't even have to take notes because they give you all the notes as well. It's just super brain fog friendly, which is awesome. I'm telling you, this is the only doctor who freaking gets it. They're, ah, they get it, guys. And all the staff gets it. They just get it. Anyway, I was listening to an audio, one of the audios as part of my program, and it was about these episodes. And Dr. Driscoll was talking about how her episodes felt. And yo, I just sat there and listened and sobbed. I sobbed my eyes out because there has never been anything more relatable in my life. I have never had a friend or like even a follower explain, like describe the episode as clearly and as detailed as Dr. Driscoll did. And I just broke down because that was my freaking doctor telling me about it and telling me about the mental implications of it and then telling me that it was gonna be okay and she's gonna help fight through it and oh my gosh. Her little personal touches. She tells her own stories and she holds your hands and gives you these hugs the whole way through. I'm just... I'm so grateful that I found this clinic because I was losing my vision and I have a baby and she's changing every day and I have this baby and she's going to change every day and I can't imagine if I had lost my vision to this. I think it's like 5 or 10%, 10% of undiagnosed pseudotumor lose their vision. I don't know. I don't know what the exact number is. It's some crazy amount. Guys, I might not have even like been able to see my daughter past another year because I was in such a sharp decline. Loading salt because that's what my POTS doctor told me I had to do in order to be able to stand up. And now I don't even put salt on my food and I stand up like it's nothing. And it's only been three months of the right diagnosis. I just, I can't explain how much POTS care clinic changed my freaking life. Stay dry. The end. <laughs> Let's end the video here. I have a lot to talk about with them. Um, I hope that this video helped those of you who are curious about the symptoms, my symptoms, the exact ways that I would describe them, and the ways that I described them back then when I was first having my big onset. Whew, distract myself. <sighs> I would love for the comments on this video to be symptoms. Please just share your symptoms. If you have migraine or pseudotumor, whatever you have, how you were similar, how you differed, I want this to be a place where people who are confused can scroll and learn. Learn about what they have and see if maybe they can hammer it out for themselves because nobody should be treated like this. Nobody should have to wait five years to be told that they have pseudotumor or even to be tested for it. Six months before I went to POTS care, four months before I went to POTS care, I was desperate. I was begging. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was at my wit's end. It literally kills me inside that there are people out there suffering with what I did, being told that they have anxiety. I went from super emotional to now I'm like a little bit pissed off again. <laughs> ah! Tell me you're pregnant without telling me you're pregnant. Everything makes me cry or makes me mad. I mostly cry in gratitude though, so that's good. <laughs> okay, I should be quiet. I've been talking for too long. I love you guys. I really can't wait to continue to tell you about my POTS care clinic journey. I can't wait to show you the video that I made with Dr. Driscoll. I can't wait to show you the unboxing. I'm going to do it on the floor with Buddy next to me so you guys can get some good buddy time because I know it's been a long time. 
So make sure that you're subscribed with your notifications on. I do post every Friday, but the time is kind of erratic. If you have your notifications on and you come to the video at the very beginning, that's when I lurk in the comments and you'll be able to hear from me, hopefully, as much as the baby allows it. Now that I know what's going on and I have actual tangible ways to help you with pseudotumor IIH with POTS, I'm really excited to just like week after week be unloading things on you as much as I can with the pregnancy and our almost one year old. You guys know that I'm like, uh, it's a little crazy right now with the holidays and our babysitter's out of town and you know, I'm just, I'm very busy and, and sick, still sick but so grateful for how much I've improved. I'm a broken record. All right, thanks for coming. Subscribe, notifications on, like button, comment with your symptoms. I'll see you guys next week.